Don't you love that psalm, Psalm 95? It's one of the most, most beautiful psalms, isn't it? Beautiful. You know, back then when God was alive. See, in many ways, we do come to the passages of Scripture as if it was way back then. Do you know what I mean? That was written to them, isn't it? Now, I, I don't have to tell you, of course, unless you were back there, this passage wasn't written to you but it most certainly was written for you. That's the distinction, isn't it? Paul actually mentioned something like that in the end of Romans. The encouragements of the faith back in the Old Testament, you know, to them. But he says to the Romans, but it was written for you, for your encouragement. That's a great distinction in case you think that that was just Psalm 95 was just about being back there. And thanks, Jeannie, for pointing out that it's mentioned four other times in the book of Hebrews. So David and the writer of Hebrews, they're saying the same issues, the same things. So I need you to do this for me this morning. Radically engage this passage with me. It's not, a to it's not an easy thing what I want to talk about this morning. And um, you'll know that... Um, when we get into it this morning, I just want to make sure no one gets up and leaves. That's the thing. The first one that gets up and leaves, you'll be tackled beside before you get out of the door. So there's enough in here to make everybody want to leave. But um, let us worship, yeah? So from where is the origin of worship? That's what I wanted to think about. From where is the origin of it? Now, I have to admit that my entry point in bringing this message to you this morning is born out of a weariness with an issue that has hounded the churches for about 60 years now. It's been called the Worship Wars. You might say, Brian, where have you been? The war's over. It's long been over. The contemporary side of the war is certainly dominating this field of battle. But the war itself is long over, Brian. The worship army called contemporary, they've all got the best machinery and all the best distribution channels. The victors, predominantly, they're young and they're creative and they're energetic. Of course, there's still the the older armies on the other side, called traditional. And they're using ammunition that is, you know, it's hundreds of years old. All this ammunition is called, they're called hymnals. Oh, it's so old. They're resilient, but they know they're beat. But a lot of churches are mixed in age, you've got both sides of these armies, two different kinds of armies. And they're, they're different in their music tastes. So the battle sides got characterized with the traditional, content-centered hymn that have words that are more, let's be honest, substantial in terms of subject matter. They reflect a more propositional, objective side of knowing about God. The other side characterized, they identified more as contemporary and creative and emotional and more subjective elements that they feel is lacking on the side of this older army type music. So with many churches, in the middle of both, which is like ours in many ways. The solution was, and I've seen it by the way, I've read 15 pages, 15 years of notes for, from the elders, uh, and if this issue has risen four times, so in case you want to know, was to, uh, the solution was to combine the styles, have two songs in each army, the traditional type songs, the contemporary type songs, and let's make everybody mad. Or at least, if you want, create different services for people so they won't even have to see each other. So, instead of anyone being happy, the truce has most people equally miffed. 
Now, you don't get mad. I don't see you don't get red in the face. It's just enough to be annoyed. But that's what happens when, in actual fact, neither side wins. So my purpose this morning is to risk everyone being upset with me and offer what I think is a, I genuinely think is a real solution. Only if it's received, immersed in grace, immersed in the grace of Christ by everyone. Now, if you all disagree, that's fine. Because if you're going to burn me on the lawn, I want us to be unified about that. I don't want to have two different camps. All right, so that's... But first we need a biblical context for worship that will root our thinking for the future. And for that I chose this psalm. I could have picked up a bunch of other ones. So my aim, my hope, is to completely reorientate us, all of us, to a new way of thinking about worship. Now, I think it's old, but maybe for us, a new way of thinking about worship, and especially congregational worship music. Easy. All right. Um, The passage, I want to, Psalm 95, if you don't have it open in front of you, please do. Um, Because it's important that I root everything I say in the text itself. You have two words in Psalm 95, in verse 1 and in verse 6. Oh, come. Oh, come. And in verse 6, it just says, come. Yeah? Oh, come. And then he says, come. Now, it looks like an invitation to something, doesn't it? If I say come, it's an invitation, isn't it? But what? Well, we answer. It's an invitation to worship God. And then it portrays him with the rest of this psalm, as it's beautifully read out this morning, with a half a dozen descriptive reasons why you should come and worship this God. Now, there are different kinds of invitations, aren't there? There are. If Charles Manson summoned you, you may not have a warm fuzzy in responding. Or if a policeman called you, would you be inclined to pedal away faster? Probably not advisable. But if you're, but you're thinking, this is God calling, Brian. We're talking about it. It's in, his, it's in the Scriptures. This is God Now, using, of course, the writer of the psalm, but it's God calling us. That's totally different, isn't it, Brian? I have a choice if he's calling. I have a choice to come or not. Or what looks like in some Sunday mornings, maybe, you might not experience this. You know, you might might be called to come Sunday morning or dragged in some cases, let's be honest, for some maybe. And I came and but I'm not really here. Do you know what I mean? I'm here, but I'm not really here. Like when you're you're a toddler and one of your parents calls you. You may come. You may not come. You're thinking, Brian, you're failing at trying to be funny, so let's just stop trying to be funny, okay? Let's just get to the thing. It's not that kind of invitation. Well, let's say it's an invitation like... An opportunity, is that what this is? An opportunity to worship God, is that what this is? God may or may not be worshipped, but we're offering an opportunity for you to do so on Sunday morning together. Well, though our modern way elevates free choice and free will, we might come to this passage with a Kind of like a preconceived notion that there is a difference between, let's say, being called by your sassy, giggly three-year-old or a seething, knife-wielding wife. You might see there's a difference with those calling. There is a difference. And even then, if, by the way, if it's your spouse calling, you may not come, for you have the freedom not to come, men. But you have, and will certainly know that if you don't, you distinctively know that it's not worth the refusal. You should come 
if she's most certainly wielding a knife, I would. Yes, I have exercised my freedom, but there are consequences, and they're going to be serious ones. So in this passage, listen carefully now. This is an invitation, but it's not what we would call a completely free, it's not completely free of expectations. When God calls, it's different than when you're, say, like your teenage children call you in the middle of the night. I know it feels like it's the same thing, but then we wake up and we realize it isn't. It, God's call is really different. The people that are called in this psalm, they've been created twice by God. One physical, look what it says in verse 6. Come, let us worship together. Let us kneel before the Lord. What he says, this Lord, he's our maker. So this song, this psalm is reflecting that this God has called those whom he has made and not just created once, but twice. Look in verse 7. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. What they would have understood in the Old Testament is that they were a people by promise by covenant, created twice, created as a nation to follow God in covenant of what he has, has made an oath that he would do on behalf of these people. So create twice, physical, then of course by promise, by covenant. So we know then that this call, are you listen, are you with me so far? This call, O come, has all kinds of built-in probabilities. There's an expectation going on. And it's the same for us as Christians. We've been created physically. Yeah? Most of us. No, we've been created physically. And we've also been created by the new covenant, we say, in Christ's blood. It's the exact same, isn't it? So the very idea of a worshipper as a kind of spectator, a kind of an observer, a kind of a receiver who attends a gathering to worship, must realize that they're in the wrong place if that's the thing, if that's what they think it is coming together on a Sunday morning. Like a person awaiting an experience of worship that is conditioned on whether we're pleased or whether we're blessed, then I'll worship to know that we cannot come with an attitude of waiting to be amused or even moved. But I want us to get all our worship ducks in a row. Let's ask the question again. From where is the origin of worship? And this is important for us. You may say, ah, easy. It's from the heart, Brian. It's from the heart. It's from our response to his character, isn't it, Brian? Yes, of course it is. Or from his actions, what he has done. Or from the benefits of his goodness, which was read out, by the way, with, um, from Esther this morning. In fact, the beginning of all worship is not in us at all. The origin of worship is not in human responses to God. So where is it? Well, firstly... The origin of all worship is within God himself because he glorifies himself better than we can worship him. His perfect worship is in himself apart from our response to him. And it has always done so. In fact, if you think about this, if God didn't find the perfection of his own glory in himself, he would have to create to fulfill that need. And if it is so, we're in real trouble because we don't glorify him according to his word or his worth. In fact, when he came to this world, he was crucified. So if the creation of the world was to fulfill some kind of need in God, we should all have a collective gulp Right now, for we would have, he would have the total right to clean the slate and start again. I am so thankful that the beginning of all worship and the perfection of all worship is firstly in God himself. I know it's probably hard to get your head around, but 
let it sink in. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to make himself feel good about his self-image. Does he delight in us? Yes, the Scripture says he does. But there's no intrinsic need in God for us to fulfill, oh, we have to worship or God's going to feel terrible. He's just, God is not, you know, Kim Jong-un, you know, when he goes by and everybody has to hail, or if there's some death, everybody's... It's, it's the, the, the measurement of... of um, of how sad they are is actually measured. And the cameras are watching to see if you're, if you're abjectly in just in sadness. And then, of course, when it's gone, it's like, you know, what's on TV? You have, you have to now come and worship me, God says. Oh, I'm just going to feel terrible about myself. But thankfully, he doesn't. Secondly, the primary reason for us to worship God is actually not in response to his character or the worthiness of the God we worship, even though it is absolutely awesome. Rather, and here's the thing, oh come, it's not subjective. It's actually an imperative. It's a command. Now, the second come isn't, but the first one is it's a command. We're to come. It's the command, but it's also the desire of this sovereign God himself for us to us. See, it's already there in the covenant. That's the whole thing, you see. His worthiness, in our eyes, is neither sought by God, nor is it determined by us. We're the creatures. He is the creator. We're the needy. We're the dependent. You know that thing that we breathe? What's it called? Um, yeah, air. It belongs to him. Think of it now. The very air you're breathing is his. Aren't you glad that he doesn't want it back? I'm so glad that he doesn't need it. He's the creator. He is the God of all what they call the old, the old theologians, the God of providence, who provides all this provision. He's that God. Which is why A.W. Tolles is totally correct, in my opinion, when he says, that the greatest single need of this moment is what he calls, okay, it might be a bit rough, light-hearted superficial religionists. Let them be struck down. I thought that was harsh. But struck down with what? With a vision of God high and lifted up. With his train filling the temple. That's what he says we should be arrested by. The holy art of worship seems to have passed away like the Shekinah glory from the tabernacle. And as a result, he says, we're left to our own devices and forces to make up that lack of spontaneous worship by bringing in what he calls cheap and tawdry activities to hold our attention. So I want to put before you this morning is that in order to be truly glorify God. Now, I know you've heard this before. This was so terrible. What I'm trying to put before us this morning is that in order to truly glorify God in our worship, we must joyfully submit our total selves to Him. So it's a whole person, isn't it? As to God who, number one, created you, and number two, has redeemed you. So I want to consider the wonder of who God is. So firstly, it's in the passage, isn't it? He's the God who reveals Himself sovereign over creation. Verse 1 to 5. Oh, come, look what it says. Oh, come, let's sing for joy. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Reason? For the Lord is a great God, and he's a great king above all gods, in whose hand, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, peaks of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for it is he who has made it, and his hands, plural, isn't that interesting? Formed the dry land. Beautiful change. See, he's the Lord. The, the Hebrew word literally means he's the completely self-existing one. You're not. He is. That's the contrast that's trying, that comes out with this word, Lord. He's eternal, and everything else completely depends on him. He's also called the king. Isn't that right? King of all gods. 
That is those who oppose him consider themselves godlike. It more refers kind of to the leaders of nations that oppose God's covenant people. You'll see it in Psalm 2 as well. Jesus takes this title to himself in the book of Revelations, and I'm actually going to take the time to read it. Book of Revelations, chapter 19. See, I t sometimes when I read these passages, I feel like we need to really close our eyes and not just get the words, but really let it sink all the way to the bottom. Revelation, chapter 19. These new Bibles, I never know where I am. Oh, here we go. Are you with me so far? All right, okay. I'm going to begin in verse 11, charm 19, in chapter 19 of Revelation, and this is what John says. I saw heaven open. I saw heaven opened. You imagine, engage your imagination. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes, there are a flame of fire, and on his head there's many diadems, because he's the king of kings, which that's why he's got many of them. And he has a name written on it, which is no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Redemptive nature, isn't it, what he's done? And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. But from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assembly, for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his enemy. Talking about Christ. So I think that verse 3, back in our Psalm 95, verse 3 when he says, For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. He's just getting a taste of what Revelation is going to talk about Christ. So the two headings, one in verse 1 and one in verse 3, look what it says, O come, and for the Lord is great. Come sing for, the joy, for joy to the Lord, for the Lord is great. It actually explodes in the passage into a kaleidoscope of breathtaking attributes of this God that, neither, that either detonates in us a response like Peter when he, he knows who Christ is in the boat and he falls down. He can't help. He says, depart from me, Jesus. I'm a sinful man. Or like John, he falls before him in worship. And a multitude of other occasions in the Scriptures where when they know they're in the presence of God, they collapse, they fall. It's the natural Response. In here, it's because they know him as creator and the owner of everything. That everything is handmade. He creates it. Hands shaped. Hands that form the dry land. And hand held. What he creates, he owns. Did you ever just think about that? Even if I didn't know Christ, he owns you. So if you didn't buy a need to him, it doesn't matter. He still owns you. You're owned because you didn't create yourself. That's the point that's coming out here. He created us. But it's, such, it's shaped in such beauty. What he creates, he owns. And what he owns, he sustains, he cares for. So when we know this to be true, we recognize his awesome power. We recognize his sovereign will and his extent, and the extent of his su supreme control over all of life. See, it's, a great, it's an argument. It's, a, it's an Old Testament argument. It argues from the greater to the lesser. Now, we've seen an instance in the New Testament where it argues from the lesser to the greater. He knows 
every hair that's on your head. That's arguing from the lesser, you couldn't get much, and most certainly for some of us, and some are less than me, you couldn't get from the, an argument from the lesser to the greater more than that. If he knows the hairs on my head, it means he's sovereign over everything. In this way, he's doing the opposite. He is the sovereign creator of all things, and therefore, guess what that means? He knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows the concerns of your heart and the tick-tocking nature of time. He knows that with all of its comings and goings. That's where he starts. This is the God who reveals himself sovereign. Sovereign over all creation. And that night needs to sink all the way down. This is who our God is. But secondly, he's a God who reveals himself sovereign in redemption. Verse 6 and 7, isn't it? Here's again, come. Let us worship. Let's bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our maker. He's our God. We're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So he combines, he combines now. The fact that he creates you, sustains you, he owns you. By the way, this is, the, this is my reason of why evangelism, when you're sharing your faith, I don't actually like the word evangelism because it, it conjures up all kinds of fears and I was a missionary for 25 years. But sharing your faith with someone, it doesn't actually start with the reality of sin. You're a harbor rotten sinner. You're distant from God. Jesus died for your sins. The place to start, most certainly the place to start today is the, is the fact that I know something about you. You are made. I know who you are. You're, you're a creation of the same God who created me. See, I think that's where we need to be beginning with a lot of people. But people don't even know who they are. They don't know why they're here. And then, of course, you can talk about a rebellion. But first is that they're created by a sovereign God. That's the Psalms, huge on that, isn't it? And now, as our covenant God, he is the rock of your security. For it's rooted in a promise that he made. He can't lie. You understand that, yeah? He can't lie. If he lies, he ceases to exist. That's the whole idea of an oath. He, he swears by his own name. He actually even said it to Abraham. We've mentioned a couple of times before with this, uh, this picture he's given where the sacrifice is made and the animal is cut. It's separated and the symbolic flame going through a representation of himself. He simply says this. If I don't fulfill my promise, may I be like these dead pieces of animals. This is God saying this. This is God. This is the creator, the redeemer who brought us into a relationship. He's this one that I've just talked about. He brought us into a relationship with himself. This God, that we're this God here, he's the one that's brought you into a relationship with him. And as such, the benefits, he cares, he protects, he feeds, and he'll never leave us, and he'll never, fors he'll never forsake us, is what it says in Hebrews. Now here's a bit now we don't normally talk about. The next bit. Consider the weight. That's what the whole idea of worship means. It's the weight of glory. The weight of his worthiness, verse 7 to 11. Today, if you would hear his voice, don't harden your heart as in Maribah that was brought out this morning. In the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers, they tested me, they tried me. Although they'd seen my work, they'd seen the work. For 40 years, I loathed. Knew it. Better translation, I was disgusted with God. I was disgusted with that generation. And they are like a people who err well, not in their calculations, but the err in the heart. Are we erring? Have we got a good theology, but we're erring in the heart, the center of our beings. And they don't know my ways. Therefore, I swore, just talked about the oath, yeah? I swore in my anger they shall not enter into my rest. It's no small thing, is it? They were delivered from Egypt. They were moaning, they complained, they grumbled. Radically individualistic. And they had seen his power over and over and over and over again. And how much they provided and they were still like this. So when we summarize... 
what I, what I think the psalmist is saying, here's your natural response to this God. It should be as a covenant people who have been brought into a relationship by the, by the blood of the covenant through the sacrifice of Christ on a cross. What, well, what does it include? What's that response look like? Well, it captures the person, you see. The whole person. The person sings and shouts to God. He can't help it. He bows down. He bows down. You say, oh, no. We wouldn't do that because whatever's going on in worship, where's it all going on? It's all in here. My bowing down is the bowing down of the heart. <laughs> and I, I don't doubt that, by the way. And I'm, This is not the pressurizers for us all to be now having this all next week. We're all bowing down. It's not my point. And kneeling before him. See, it's a whole person, isn't it? They're literally bowing down physically. They're kneeling. Now, I, was, I have a Roman Catholic background. This is all easy for us. You didn't know whether you were genuflecting, kneeling, blessing yourself, because you, you had 15 different things. It was like a, an aerobics class in many ways. When we were kids, we couldn't, we couldn't even understand what was going on. But I do get it. It's a whole person response, isn't it? They're praising him and thanking him uh, for who he is. They're listening to him humbly with a passion to obey him without any conditions, resting in his goodness, rejoicing in his glorious name. That's just a psalm alone. So when we summarize it like this, the very least we can do is to come before him with songs that bristle with the content of glory centered in his person and in his work. That we bring a commitment that is at once contemporary to the general style of our day. Of the people in this church. In other words, every song must have words that are, have content, have meaning. That are about him that draw us to him, what he has done. No matter our present experience. I need it to be said, we're not just to have a content of glory and an excellence of quality, but songs that we can all lift our hearts together in the worship of our great King, who is indeed Lord. For our concern is that He is worshipped as Lord in this congregation, this one. The criteria is not what other people are singing, but what this actual church can sing together. This church. Are we concerned more for the worship or for the God we worship? The Psalms say that, of course, it's all about Him. Of course, it's all about Him. We'd all say it's about Him. But do we really believe this? Well, then if we do, the very least we can do is be able to be united in this. So I ask myself, what if it all got taken away tomorrow? What if all of our hymnals disappeared tomorrow? Every one of them. What if all the contemporary songs were all disappeared tomorrow? Would we still really worship him? Can, can you imagine us without those things? What would we do? Well, maybe we'd have to write some of our own. Weissner's. And others. Well, what I'm advocating, please hear me, is the end of the worship wars and charting a new course that is loaded with the content of the gospel that glorifies our Creator and our Redeemer. Charting a new course where the music style is focused in neither camp, temp contemporary or hymns, neither one, neither end camp. I call it contemporary hymnish. Okay, that was supposed to be tongue in cheek, right? But <laughs> good. But I, I doubt that's gonna that's gonna, you know, last. More than likely it won't. But you know what I mean. My deep intention is that we worship together. Together. Young. Old, long hair, no hair. I don't care. That rhymed. I didn't even mean that. Like a, like a rap artist. 
with a passionate desire to do exactly, literally what this psalm says. And that repair jobs for falling plaster would be a regular occurrence for the voices of God's redeemed people who sing for joy to the Lord and shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, who come before his presence with thanksgiving, who shout joyfully to him with psalms. Why? For the Lord is great. He's a great God, and he's, he's a great king above all, who we worship and who we bow down to and kneel before the Lord, our maker. Why? Because he's, 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 he's our God. And we, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let's buy. Our Heavenly Father, we hardly know how to respond this morning, except for we know what this psalm says. You are glorious. You really are, whether we recognize it or not. You are awesome in your power. There's a beauty in your holiness to such a gracious, compassionate reaching out to us who rebelled against you to bring us into a knowledge of who you are so that our natural response of the heart is just to collapse in front of you because of who you are, because of what you've done. <sighs> our Heavenly Father, we want our hearts to be changed all of us. We want to have our whole church a worshipping community. A worshipping community. You have to do something huge in us to bring us on this probably frustrating journey for us, Lord. But we cry out to you for help. Help us. In the name of Jesus. Amen.